Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, Israel strikes back with limited restraint hits at Iranian military targets in Iran, Syria, and Baghdad. Plus, putting money in Iran's pocket. A look at the Iran sanctions waiver, recently renewed by the Biden administration. Plus, keeping focus on the hostages still in Gaza, with a poignant display at kibbutz near Oz. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Israel has reportedly struck targets in Iran in response to last weekend's massive missile and drone attack against the Jewish state. Some see the attack was designed to respond to Iran's attack, but not spark a wider regional war. The Iranian Tasneem news agency reported the assault took place in the southeastern part of the city near its nuclear energy mountain. Isfahan is the site of one of Iran's major nuclear sites, enriching uranium for Iran's nuclear program. According to the Jerusalem Post, the attack on Isfahan was carried out with long-range missiles launched from aircraft, not drones or land-air missiles. An Iranian official told Reuters there is no plan for an immediate response. It is not clear who is behind the attack. An Iranian TV anchor downplayed the attack and quoted a military official in Isfahan. Uh, he did uh, confirm that uh, there were some uh, loud sounds that were heard in the east of the city of Esfahan, and this was related to the air defense system, as uh, we told you and our viewers before, uh, triggered by the presence of uh, three small drones uh, that were present in that area. On local television, other reporters near the area showed how quiet and normal Isfahan looks. Middle East expert Avi Milliman told CBN News Iran seems to be minimizing the story on purpose. Yona Bob, Jerusalem Post military correspondent and author of the book Target Tehran, told CBN News the strike sends a clear message. The message behind the strike from Israel was, Iran, you cannot do what you did last weekend. You attacked Israel directly. You attacked with 350 aerial threats. 170 drones, 120 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles. That cannot happen again. If it does, you will suffer and you will suffer large. Bob also says the attack was calibrated to avoid a regional war and represents a crossroads to Israel and Iran. This is a unique moment. There was a shadow war between Israel and Iran that we talk about in our book, Target Tehran, for a long time. The question now is, Will we go back to that shadow war, or has the paradigm been crushed? And even though Israel isn't officially taking credit for what happened today, will there be additional direct exchanges between Iran and Israel? We will only know that going forward. The attack in Isfahan took place on the 85th birthday of Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Meanwhile, some analysts are saying that Israel's response was measured, only enough to give an answer to the Iranian attack. That's because it's preparing to enter the last Hamas stronghold in the city of Rafa in Gaza to complete the goal of finishing off Hamas and its leadership and getting the hostages back. IDF troops are still operating in the central Gaza Strip, eliminating terrorists and striking military compounds, observation posts and rocket launchers and launching points. They've also destroyed 17 tunnel shafts. But for now, the world's focus is on the tensions between Israel and Iran and what comes next. For analysis of Israel's limited strikes at Iran's military targets, CBN President Gordon Robertson spoke with Jonathan Conricus, former IDF officer and senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Here's an excerpt. I think that what Israel is trying to do is to de-escalate a quite tense situation where Iran deviated from the rules of the game so far uh, by striking Israel directly. Iran deviated from that, and then Israel now responded. But Israel responded in such a way that allows Iran an out, and they, Israel isn't taking a, a responsibility for the attack, and Israel isn't gloating about the success of the attack, but really allowing Iran to save face and to tell the Iranian public stories about mysterious explosions that were heard. But what really Israel wants to deliver here, wants to deliver is a message that Iranian defenses are 
impenetrable, that Iran is exposed to Israeli precise and accurate strikes, and that Isfahan, where there are nuclear sites and facilities, is an, a, a target that is accessible for Israel. Now, Israel struck with only a fraction of the amount of missiles that Iran fired at Israel because Israel is more professional and precise. And Israel could have struck 10 different sites, but chose one and a few others just to send a message of capability. Well, last night, uh, uh, when the news broke, and in, in our, my timeline, it was about 10 p.m., uh, I, I literally thought, oh, no, this is, we're, we're now in a regional war. This is going to be incredible. The uh, Iranian foreign minister already said, if Israel attacks, we're going to respond. Uh, do you think this limited response and then what Iran is clearly doing uh, in, in their own media saying this didn't come from Israel, uh, have we seen the end of this direct cycle of attacks between the two countries? I think we could carefully assess that to be true. And yes, that maybe this current round, which started in Damascus, went on to Israel, the Nevatim base in southern Israel was the main target, and now Isfahan. Maybe this round of blows is uh, being packed and put to rest, but we are certainly, we have crossed Rubicons. Iran and Israel have both crossed uh, Rubicons that they haven't crossed before, so we are in new territory where the rules of engagement will change. I think what Israel did was in response to U.S. requests and European requests of not striking back, Israel said to everybody, and we've been saying that consistently for a week, Israel is going to retaliate. There's no scenario that Israel doesn't retaliate. But I think that what Israel did here was to prefer the strategic objectives of going into Rafah, finishing the fighting in Gaza and defeating Hamas and getting our hostages back, and then availing ourselves also to Hezbollah instead of going into a bigger and more dangerous and violent uh, conflict with the Iranians. Well, let's talk about the strategic piece uh, on this. It, it looks like uh, Iran's attack on Israel is, is now uh, forcing uh, it to be isolated from the rest of the Middle East. And it, and it looks like Israel's ties are now strengthened with Jordan, strengthened with Saudi Arabia. Is that your view? Yeah, you know, what, what I think is quite amazing is that, you know, many European countries and the U.S., they told Israel, don't retaliate and uh, we'll do sanctions on Iran instead. And there's been some pretty... Uh, watered down sanctions being offered against Iranian officials and entities, nothing really that will matter for the Iranians. But the regional uh, neighbors, I think that they are looking at what's happening in the region and they see Israel striking Iran precisely and professionally without collateral damage, without civilians getting killed or anything of that mind. But they see that and I think that what they read is strength, poise and strategic capabilities, exactly what they need from a future ally. For further analysis, I spoke with John Wagi to get his take on how Israel's restrained strike on Iran affects the political scene. Take a look. John, the last several days has almost seemed surreal. Last Saturday night, Sunday morning, I mean, it looked like the apocalypse was happening. Then people got up and had to decide go to work. Here we are several days later. Apparently, Israel has attacked Iran. How, how do you react to all this? Well, it does have a surreal quality, Chris. And it's, it's, uh, it's really remarkable to note that you can wake up in the middle of the night and hear, hear the sound of exploding uh, rockets, and then you come get up the next morning and there are birds chirping and that's all you can hear. It's just quiet and silent. Um, here in the Middle East, I think it's, it's different than what's going on in Washington. I think that Washington, there's a sense of almost a, um, Carolyn Glick, uh, the columnist mentioned, a, a video game quality. In other words, like they're playing a game here. And I think it's much more real here in, in, in the Middle East, where countries like Jordan and Saudi Arabia are wondering what their future's like when Iran can fire 500 or uh, 300 missiles at Israel, and Israel promises a retaliation. And at the same time, we're hearing that, according to the Washington Post, this was all carefully calibrated. Well, I don't think people here want 
carefully calibrated much longer. I think they want to see some movement toward the good guys. I think they want to see Hamas eradicated. They want to see a real potential for peace coming to the Middle East, and they're tired of this, somebody putting the brakes on all the time and stopping what might end up actually bringing peace more to the Middle East, which is a defeat of some of the terror groups. Like Hamas and Hezbollah. Um, and the head of the snake, Iran. Finally, John, where do, we, where do we go from here? Well, I think well, there'll be more of this calibration, but at some point, if Israel truly does go into Gaza and, and attack Iran's proxy head on, I think we're going to come to a more serious time uh, yeah. of, of real movement on this thing rather than a carefully managed sort of military ballet that we've right. seen for months. John Waggy, Middle East analyst, great to be with you. Coming up, empty chairs at the Seder table, remembering the hostages at Kibbutz near Oz. Ahead of the upcoming Passover holiday, family members of those taken hostage October 7th came together at their devastated kibbutz to cry out once again for their loved one's freedom. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl brings us their story. The Jewish people celebrate Passover each year with a Seder meal, recalling the Israelites' miraculous exodus from Egypt after Moses told Pharaoh, let my people go. Known as the holiday of freedom, those here have the same message for the captors still holding their loved ones hostage. We want them to celebrate the upcoming holiday with us and not in dark tunnel in inhuman conditions. Let our people go. This is the dining room at Kibbutz near Oz. Last Passover, it was full of hundreds of people celebrating the holiday of freedom for the Passover Seder. This year, there won't be one. A year ago, they all uh, celebrated uh, here in the dining room together. Old people, young people, babies, children. Uh, it's a very special holiday here. Amir al Fasa is the nephew of Avner and Maya Gorin, both murdered by Hamas. Maya's body is still held in Gaza. I want the world to not be indifferent to what happened here, to scream and shout with us and, uh, and put uh, pressure on Hamas, uh, Qatar, whatever they can to bring our people back. A Seder table with matzah, grape juice, and empty place settings has yellow chairs around it with pictures of those still missing from the kibbutz. While some are confirmed to be dead, the conditions of others, like the family of Ofri Bibas, are unknown. Her brother Yarden, his wife Shiri, and their sons Ariel and Kfir, who turned one in January, remain captive. Just knowing that no matter how hard it is for me, uh, it, must, it's, it, it is much harder for them. Uh, they are going through hell and they need us to speak for them and to remind them and to remind the world and uh, that they are over there and that it's the most unhumanitary situation there is. She sees the connection with the upcoming holiday as crucial. Because Passover is the, we call it the holiday of freedom and their freedom was being taken for them six months ago. More than a quarter of kibbutz near Oz's members were either killed or kidnapped on October 7th. 36 of them, some of them not alive, are still in Hamas captivity in Gaza. Yael Adar is the mother of 38-year-old Tamir Adar, murdered and held in Gaza. As part of the kibbutz security team, Tamir left his family in the bomb shelter to help defend his community that fateful day. I want every place in the world, just before they say who is guilty, who is not guilty, ask yourselves if it's possible to have a reality where they kidnap people, rape, murder, and the other side is supposed to be quiet? Given the terror attacks that happened in Israel could happen anywhere, Adar questions why the world holds Israel to a double standard. If that reality sounds logical to someone, they can volunteer to have it happen to them. And everyone who says to himself, this won't happen in my country, then they should make sure it doesn't happen in this country. It's impossible that it happens here, and they tell us, stop the war. Imagining how her little nephews would enjoy Passover if they were free, Bibis calls on the world to help. Will they be granted the freedom so cruelly taken from them? 
Hasn't the time come for the whole world to also shout for Ariel and Kfir? A shout for justice, for justice, for humanity, for an end to this nightmare. Let my family go. Let our people go. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Kibbutz near O's. Renewing the Iran sanctions waiver, where will the money Iran can now access be going? The Biden administration recently renewed a sanctioned waiver providing Iran access to $10 billion in frozen funds. While it stated that money can only be used for humanitarian needs, critics say the regime could bypass that condition and put it towards developing nuclear weapons. While there has been much debate over Iran's frozen assets, Richard Goldberg of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies tells CBN News this latest move got little media attention. Big news recently about a $10 billion sanctions waiver. Can you describe what the sanctions waiver is? Congress passed a series of sanctions laws to put pressure on the Islamic Republic of Iran. One of those laws passed in 2012 basically said you can't do any business with the energy sector of Iran, period. Iraq happens to be dependent on Iran for electricity. And so we have been giving Iraq a waiver to physically import the electricity, but we made a condition on that waiver. You can't let Iran get the money. Goldberg then explained what's in the fine print. What President Biden has done is change that deal with the Iraqis. And so when he issues these waivers now, he says to the Iraqis, you can now move the money to Iranian bank accounts outside of Iran, in this case in Oman and let Iran process transactions. So we're giving them $10 billion effectively of budget support in a major change of policy. What are your thoughts about the claim by the Biden administration that $10 billion won't be accessible to the Iranian regime? They're saying that the money doesn't go into Iran. They're not saying Iran can't access the money outside of Iran. The Biden administration gave assurances that the use of the funds is restricted. These funds, as I said, can only be used for humanitarian and other non-sanctionable purposes. In response to a September 2023 waiver, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi boasted the funds will be used wherever we need it. So the question remains why the Biden administration would continue issuing the waiver. The purpose of the funds, where the funds sit, these are all distractions from the core truth. It's a financial bailout. Now they get a new $10 billion pot to subsidize all their imports, freeing up a different $10 billion for what? Terrorism, missiles, nuclear weapons development, and so on. What do you think the Biden administration's motives are for releasing these funds? The White House is desperate for quiet. It's an election year. It's politics. The world is on fire at the moment due to policies of the last three years. And the president is very desperate to quiet things down, even if it means paying an extortion racket of the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. Born in Iran, national security expert Eli Kohanim moved to America as a refugee. Many of the Iranian people, 80 percent or so, who don't support the Islamic regime, how do they interpret this kind of sanctions relief? What I see daily on social media from Iranians who reach out to me from Iran directly is a lot of support for Israel. The Iranian people have taken to the streets over and over again, demanding freedom from this oppressive dictatorial regime. And they're always hoping that the U.S. will stand by their side. So when the United States does things like free up $10 billion to the regime, it makes the Iranian people feel abandoned right now. She also believes this could be playing into the hands of U.S. enemies outside the Middle East. China, Russia, which is in this axis with Iran and uh, North Korea, they're certainly watching the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. And it's just a terrible signal. We cannot be on the one hand fighting Iran and on the other hand funding them. Kohanim does have hope that better decisions will be made following her recent visit to the Kafar Aza kibbutz attacked by Hamas and meeting with some of the hostages' families. The massacre and torture and rape that Hamas committed on October 7th, I think, has given everyone some sense of clarity that this is really a fight between good and evil. Hamas, the Islamic Republic of Iran, they stand against everything that we value, freedom of religion, the empowerment of women, democracy. We need to fight for our world and the world that our children and grandchildren are going to be inheriting for us. 
still ahead, a hand of protection over Israel, a modern miracle the whole world saw. An extraordinary thing happened during the recent drone and missile attack from Iran, and it's not getting much press. Some would call it a miracle. Our friend Rabbi Yitzhak Adlerstein from the Simon Wiesenthal Center shared his thoughts about it. Rabbi Yitzhak Adlerstein, great to be with you again. Great to be back. Yeah, tell us uh, April 13th or into the 14th, what do you believe happened? I, I believe that we were all witness to nothing short of a miracle of biblical proportions. I think it's going to take a little while for the, the full effect of it, for the facts to set in. But it wasn't, hey, the IDF was really successful with the aid of our allies, and Israel survived, even though there was stuff coming in all over the country, literally. 99% of the projectiles coming in, drones and missiles, were, were, were shot down. There was minimal property damage and one, one serious injury in a Bedouin village. Now, how, how do you account for that? You know, um, when, the, when the Jews left uh, Egypt, Passover, which we're on the verge of, um, you had the really great Cecil B. DeMille moments, the ten plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea. But, you know, what happened after that? What happened in the aftermath? There were two countries. Both had experienced the same thing. They had witnessed the same thing. But the Israelites went on to Sinai to accept the Torah and make a new covenant with God. The Egyptians went right back to where they were before. This is always what happens with miracles. The believer understands that this is the hand of God. And the non-believer finds some way of accounting for it. And, uh, I don't know, we'll figure it out. We'll kick it down the road a couple of centuries. Somebody will explain it. There's, there's no way to make a believer out of miracles. But for those of us who believe in God's hand in history, how could you not see that this was the hand of God protecting his land? In any kind of conflict, give credit to the IDF. But there's always human error. There are always things that get through. You know, the friendly fire casualties in Gaza have been some of the highest in recorded armed conflict, because we're fighting in urban territory, 20 percent, they feel. But it's not just restricted to, to Gaza. When you're, when you're out there shooting down those things, it's just so easy for one, two, three to get through but not a single one. How do you account for that? And that enemies of Israel joined the fight? Yes, they had their political interests. It's true. The Iranians have been trying to unseat the king of Jordan and install mm -hmm. a Shiite presence in, 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 in their country. But still, to have the active assistance of the United States, Great Britain, Saudi Arabia, now, yesterday, conceded that, yes, they were actively helping, and, and Jordan. That's a small miracle. The bigger miracle is the degree to which Israel was spared. We were all, at 2 o'clock in the morning, sitting there, waiting for the, for the onslaught. And we went down to the bomb shelters. Hey, what are we doing here? Nothing's happening. And a few minutes later, you all clear, we come out and we watch this fireworks show, like no 4th of July that I've ever experienced. Just watching those incoming lights take down the, 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 the missiles that were aimed at us. So, you know, this is my passion right now, to, to Jew, to non-Jew, to anyone who believes in God and believes that Hinei lo yonum velo yishon shomei Yisrael, the God of Israel does not slumber or sleep, that this is what we saw. And it doesn't mean the end of the war. It doesn't mean that God isn't somehow still, who knows what he has in store for us. But you know, even in the midst of tragedy, God has a habit of sending these little notes. I know you can't figure out the bigger picture and what's going on, but I just want to reassure you, I haven't gone anyplace. I'm still with you. That's what we lived through. 
Well, a lot of people here in Israel do feel that was a miracle. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. You can follow us on social media and access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. Please continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the safety of IDF soldiers, and all those caught in harm's way, and for the release of all the hostages. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.